Hello, sorry for the delay, a little bit of microphone trouble, but we are here now. Me and Dr. Robillard, ex-Eton, ex-Oxford, taking you through some important texts that we feel neglected in today's academic climate. And we're continuing with a lesson on Timothy Gordon's case for patriarchy. We've looked at how the West was lost. We've looked at the roots of feminism. Now we're thinking about the road to recovery with the cardinal virtues. Dr. Robillard, great to have you today. Same here, same here. Glad to be back. Hope you had a lovely Christmas period. Yeah, you as well. You as well, I have. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Excellent. So we'll begin with our prayer and then get into what the cardinal virtues are and why they matter so much to anybody looking to become a good man. Let me bring this forward and then everybody at home, please do join us. Come, Holy Spirit, Divine Creator true source of light and fountain of wisdom. Pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect. Dissipate the darkness which covers me, that of sin and of ignorance. Grant me a penetrating mind to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So as a recap from our previous lesson on Tim's book, let's just think about this point that the key to the moral life inheres in what Aristotelians call the functional argument. What is meant by this? Tim explains it to do with having to actualize potentialities according to the kind of thing that we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if anyone has followed us when we went through the phaser book, uh, they'll be familiar with the idea of telos or of final causality. So this is the idea that a being has a, uh, a direction or a purposeful nature that is built into it. And as you said, having that potential become actualized constitutes the what is good for that that thing. So uh, what is good for a dog or the, the final telos of a dog is not the same as that of a human. So uh, we can talk about the what it is to be a, a flourishing dog and what a flourishing dog life looks like, but what the nature of a human is, it's going to, it's going to be different. It's going to be substantively different because we're, we're higher ordered beings. And, uh, in particular, males and females are going to have different natures and different teloses uh, as well. So what is going to look like a flourishing life for the actualization of a boy into a man is going to be different from that of a girl into a woman and, and vice versa. Let's start then with the basics. So if we consider all living things, we've got the threefold breakdown that Aristotle gave of vegetables, animals, and then man, the rational animal. So what is special? about a dog, say, compared to a stick of broccoli? And then what does a human have that neither of those two things has? Mm -hmm. Well, the dog is sentient. The dog has uh, animation to it in ways and, and motility in ways that the stick of broccoli doesn't. Uh, it arguably has interests uh, and uh, then going up higher, humans have a rational will and an intellect and are sentient as well. And uh, we can conceive of things like God and uh, start to talk about things like rational uh, elements of God. We can talk about uh, our prior mathematics. Uh, we can contemplate, we can have discussions about uh, higher order things. Yeah, that's really well put. So we are animals, but we are rational animals. And that's what being made in the image of God really means. We are possessors of intellect and free will, which means that 
the kind of creature we are is ordered towards knowledge and towards virtue those two things so dogs for example don't concern themselves with algebra or poetry or with music only mm. human beings do no other animal has a culture either mm. because in human beings education is the work of transmitting culture and it doesn't come to us through our instincts or genes alone it's the work of the mind or of the intellect now everyone can see that unless they are insane looking around the, the world around us that human beings are unique but there are some people who don't feel comfortable with this idea that there really is something special about us metaphysically but that's all really that the image of god is saying knowledge free will certainly yeah and i think in particular in the later 20th century contemporary philosophy there's been such an effort to want to model that distinction in kind and keep applying the sorites paradox you know the paradox of the heap where the the grain of sand I add a, a single grain of sand. And I keep iterating that until I have a, a, a pile of pile of, or a heap of sand. And the whole point of that paradox is that, well, there's some, you know, there's, there's vague boundaries in the world conceptually or metaphysically. So you have folks like Peter Singer trying to just double down on that Sorites paradox on the distinction between man and animal and say, really, there is no distinction in kind. It's just a, it's just a difference in degree. And then once you can muddle that boundary, now you have things uh, like bestiality or uh, you know valuing of whatever um, insects over people uh, if you run it long enough. So yeah, right. And speech is not the thing that makes us human. It's rather a sign of the fact that we are rational because mm -hmm. alone among all animals, we can grasp and manipulate abstract concepts and know some truths as being necessarily true in all possible worlds which is not the kind of thing that has any evolutionary purpose or reason to come about so this isn't some kind of god of the gaps argument where we're saying well i guess that uh, purely materialistic evolutionary processes haven't yet explained the human capacity for abstract thought and the fact that we have free will but maybe one day um mm. Who knows? They will. This is a God of the Gaps argument. No, it's not that. It's metaphysically impossible in principle for the intellect to have arisen through purely natural processes in a materialistic way. Yeah. And, and what's more, we require the, that type of abstract thinking to even get a theory of evolution off the ground. So it ends up becoming a category error to try to collapse uh, all of our abstract and a priori concepts into an evolutionary uh, reductive account. Yeah, with the argument from reason developed by people like Alvin Plantinga, who um, have said that if it were true that all our thinking was uh, merely due to physical cause and effect and evolutionary processes, that would undercut our ability to even articulate such a theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we mean then by the functional argument is that human beings are ordered towards virtue and knowledge, and that's where the importance of the cardinal virtues comes in. These aren't things that you're going to teach to a, a cat or a dog or a zebra or a badger, whatever it might be. Pick any animal you want. These things aren't going to apply. And Aquinas makes a big point of quoting this verse from the Book of Wisdom. Temperance and prudence, justice and fortitude. Nothing in life is more profitable for mortals than these. And this is the passage that Tim also points to in his explanation of them. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that all the virtues reduce down to these four called cardinal, Latin cardio, the hinge. Everything mm -hmm. hinges on these. So think of them as being like a, a door to all the others. Yeah. Yeah, it is, uh, I think, the, the correct account. And uh, yeah, they end up being like meta, meta virtues that coordinate the other virtues. I wasn't told anything about any of these 
through my school or university lessons or lectures. And yet these are the most important things to know about for a human being. Pretty much the same uh, with my, myself as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there might have been a, a very cursory reference to them. But once again, it's like that's, yeah, the ancients thought, thought these things. You know, Stoics had some ideas too. And that's that's just on the shelf collecting dust. And we've, we've moved on from from there. Yeah, the, even the idea of virtue for some people sounds kind of quaint because it suggests mm, that there's mm. one way of behavior which is really better than another and there is mm -hmm. a correct way for a human being to live yeah and that runs contrary to the relativistic hyper tolerant world that we're, we're we're in right now so let me put a question to you then why can't i make my own cardinal virtues how come these four apply to everyone why can't mine be things like being really good at seducing people, earning lots of money, and winning any argument I'm ever in? Why can't I say that I have different things that I really care about and matter most to me? Well, if we think that there is an objective reality and that there is an objective good then the virtues are going to be equally objective in their directionality towards hitting the mark of that good. It, as you mentioned before, it's saying that this is my good or this is my virtue. It's comparable to saying, well, th th these are my multiplication tables or this is my reality. Uh, it it's renders all the very idea of good uh, completely uh, self-referentially incoherent and 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 radically relativistic. So the the it even gets weirder. Where why couldn't the person making these stipulations just keep ch changing their definitions uh, of what the good is uh, uh, indefinitely? So there's no there's no fixed points in that moral universe uh, at all. I like the idea of fixed points because not only in Greek, but also in Hebraic and Arabic as well, the word for sin in all three is actually a concept coming from archery. It's about hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. So virtue is about hitting the target, the right course of action, the right proportion, the right means, the right moment. It's that bullseye and the virtuous man is a good aim he's a good shot so it's a mark that is the same mm. given what human nature is because we all share that one human nature and we're trying to bring it to full flourishing that's what virtue is and the word in latin is actually in its root to do with not just strength but man so if you lose the understanding of virtue then you also lose the understanding of what makes a man what makes a strong mm. man i like that i like that a lot uh I, I hadn't heard of that with the uh the first things you mentioned with respect to the hebraic but yeah that's that's excellent good for you as a ex-military man to have virtue as marksmanship <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah these things uh form formally and functionally end up becoming <laughs> uh very very close yeah so let's just deal with a question that is important enough that Aquinas thought fit, uh, fit to address it in uh, his work, which is, are there really only four cardinal virtues? People who've looked at Aristotle's, at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics will see that he lists 12 different virtues, but we're talking about just four. So Aquinas thinks about the objections and says, okay, first one, perhaps prudence guides and regulates the others. So actually it's above them. There's really just one super virtue called mm, prudence. Mm. Uh, Plato was always after this like, unifying virtue, a bit like in Lord of the Rings, when you have the one ring to rule them all, bind them. Mm. 
Objection number two, Aquinas considers the view that uh, practical reason and right appetite, as Aristotle says, are really the two things that set the moral virtues in order. So it looks like we've only got two things that are really cardinal. Objection three, okay, we've got some virtues that aren't the cardinal ones, but even then we have some that are more important than the others. So what are we going to do about them? We can't say they're just equally unimportant. We have to rank them somehow. So they seem mm -hmm. like they're up there. They seem like they're somehow principal ones. And having looked at all these three, he says, no, with respect to reasoning itself, prudence is the principal virtue. But with respect to bringing something else into rational order, we need the other three. So prudence only applies to the act of reasoning. But the other three are actually about bringing other things, not reason itself, into rational order. So this is why he says that justice relates to our external deeds, what we actually bring about by our will. It puts them in order. But if you're going to do this, if you're going to bring something about, you run into difficulties. Because let's see that uh, prudence has said, OK, you need to do this particular task. But maybe you feel particularly uh, lustful in that moment and you want to do something else instead and temperance has to say no we're not going to do this instead we have to stick to what the right course of action is that prudence has decided so temperance resists whatever goes against reason but you also can get the situation where your reason is asking to do something but you don't feel up to it you recoil. Maybe you're scared, for example. You're put off by fear of death, or it could be fear of hard work. So fortitude has to harden your resolve, whereas temperance dampens it down. Fortitude has to harden it. So in a nutshell, that's Aquinas' account of why we need these four things, and we can't reduce them down to one, two, or even three. And the replies to the objections are quite interesting. So Number one, if prudence is the only thing that really matters, he says, how come we get among the other virtues heads? So they are foremost over particular kinds. So temperance, for example, heads up abstinence, sobriety, chastity, purity. And we get that with the other cardinal virtues too. For objection two, the idea that you only need two things, practical reason and right appetite. He says, no, there are three, three ways in which desire must be made right. We've got justice, temperance, fortitude. These all have different jobs to do. Mm. And then for the third one, yes, he agrees. There are plenty of other virtues, but ultimately they all come back to these big ones. Just like you can have a tree with many smaller branches but they're all connected to big bowels. So that, I think, is the most useful way to think of the cardinal virtues mm -hmm. with a tree image. So the 12 that Aristotle lists, for example, and there are, in fact, far more than 12, but even if we just take his 12, they all connect to the big branches of the cardinal virtues. Interesting to think about that, isn't it? So there's this dream of getting them down to only one, which Plato had. Aristotle thought 12, but logically, four is the way to go. I like that way of carving things up insofar as, yeah, he can explain how they all, they all connect. And there is a, uh, a subordination of the, the other ones under the, um, uh, the, the main four. Yeah. And among the main four, prudence is the boss as it were because it relates to the act of reasoning itself but mm -hmm. to be able to bring things about in accordance with reason we still have to act with justice and we have to have temperance and fortitude to control things or dampen them but also to bring them up it's funny i, I had a thought as you're reading that as to what one of the main problems are with uh with mainstream academia, it seems overly focused, or at least academic philosophy, it seems overly focused on the prudence aspect of things, but takes no account of the, the other three virtues. So it's, uh, there's a lot of 
ideal idealization of this is how people would behave in an idealized world but okay yeah fine but how are we going to get them <laughs> how are we going to get people to behave that way and it's like oh well we'll just have more and more laws that are pinch upon people it's like well mm -hmm. there's another another way to do it is you could try to foster virtue in the citizens and uh and that could be a, a way to to satisfy those prudential ends yeah it comes back to the point made at the start about man being a rational animal because you've got the the passions which need to be trained and virtue is a kind of cultivating so it's all very well deciding what the right course of action is, but then you actually have to bring it about. And then you run into the messy reality of what a fully embodied human being really is. And it's not just some abstract solution to a, a logic problem. It's somebody who has fear, for example, and desire to do all sorts of other things in the moment than the right course of action. Yeah. And that, and that looks, that looks like a judgment. Right. That looks like saying that that person or way of being in the world is better than a vicious way of being. And that that ruffles feathers. Yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's elitist in it. It's saying that this is human nature and this is the best way to act. And you're wrong if you think otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in a way, this makes very intuitive sense in the way that even a child can grasp, because there's never been any culture that has praised cowardice in battle for example <laughs> yeah yeah i mean how how else yeah when you really think about it like how else would it would it look you, yeah you couldn't have a society of all vicious individuals or all vicious institutions it just that's just not the way that humans are that's not the way that civilizations are wait is the is the way you can run aground on like the rocks of reality and find out the hard way so if we all start praising mm -hmm. um unchastity in people for example if we say this is a good thing because we just decide that we can make up our own virtues and we like it when uh, people cheat on each other we like it when people don't get married we think promiscuity is great that's one of the things that the sexual revolution has tried to say is okay. Mm. Well, you don't get away with that in the long run. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe uh, that last claim is really the important one, right? It's something about like time horizons with respect to prudence that are uh, forgotten about perhaps in the contemporary moment. Unwin's Sex and Culture, which I've tried to really popularize, says that a generation can get away with living off the accumulated capital and social energy of the previous one, but it can't transmit that to the next one. So he says mm. three generations is what it takes for the shit to really hit the fan with big mistakes regarding sexual morality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that, that's a really profound point. I, I thought, I didn't know where he was getting three from, but I think that, yeah, that makes sense about the transmitting of those values is real, really where it, it gets dark. That's it. Um, Nourish asks, are these specific virtues translated from mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, they are. If we just go back a couple of slides, there you go. Book of Wisdom, 8-7. That's where you'll find them all. And Aquinas quotes it sort of, I think, six, seven times. It's one of his favorite verses. So they're all there in the Bible. And you can see it in the pagan writers as well. Cicero, for example. This is another case of revelation building on and clarifying what can be known by natural reason so these don't just pop out of nowhere there's a long tradition of writing about virtue and even where they disagree slightly they are circling around this list of four mm -hmm. just like we said with the ten commandments which were a privileged expression of natural law it's just the bible making clear what philosophers have grasped in a slightly cloudier way before it now interesting point here is that tim says that schooling is instruction 
in the moral and intellectual virtues that vary between the sexes and that this means that it necessarily has to be different for boys and for girls and co-ed is a very recent development in human history i mean even schools are for example to be honest most of the people who've ever lived didn't go to school they had tutors like alexander mm -hmm. the great mm -hmm. philip mm -hmm. of macedonia his father just hired aristotle as his tutor imagine that yeah and one-on-one yeah. -on -one lessons with aristotle that was how he learned things and girls in particular until very recently were educated at home by private tutors boys ended up going to uh, apprenticeships and having to work a bit earlier and they went to school before girls did but the mixing of the two sexes in classrooms in rows of desks that is something that is completely alien to most human cultures and trying to teach them in the same way in the same subjects is also very alien mm -hmm. and i would even argue that it was the beginning of the end for education because you have at that point admitted this idea of equality as identity yes yeah yeah i agree as i've mentioned this in our c mask shows perhaps on this one is that the first rule of um counterinsurgency is to break up the men so if i want to pacify a particular culture then i i need to make things as co-ed as possible i need to make sure that that men uh are not uh learn learning wisdom transmitted from their from their elders uh and uh the, the more you can model those categories the more pacified people are yeah i think that's a fair point and what you what you get i think in particular is an environment that is bad for boys especially when you have co-ed because they're yeah, expected yeah. to behave a bit like um dampened down girls i mean that's the ideal modern student someone who doesn't ever call out who's not particularly active who's not going to be uh combative in discussion someone who's mm -hmm. going to behave well at all times in a, a quiet peaceful way and isn't going to want too much competition the general move in education is to uh, remove competition and everyone have prizes yeah i think that's largely a function too of just yeah, the, the physical space right it's very sedentary it's in rows it's people uh, raising hands it's not out on a it's not co-ed but they're all out in the woods chopping wood or on a on a, a scouting uh, mission or something like that you know that that's not normally what we think of when we think of co-ed education we think classroom sedentary right and girls do better than boys in modern educational institutions right up to university so mm -hmm. it suits girls better than it suits boys yeah so there's no male cardinal virtues though and no female cardinal virtues is mm -hmm. the same for everyone so what do we mean when we say that there are different moral and intellectual virtues for the two sexes like there's no male prudence and female prudence so mm -hmm. what's going on here well it's that we're still yeah they're not particularized to the particular biological sex rather the biological sex in virtue of what their nature is is they're going to realize these virtues differently so they're not indexed they're not same way with like rights claims or duties claims you know they're, they're not particular to the um the particular person rather it's just that they're they're realized differently through different what the person is yeah i think that's a great way to put it so it looks different in a man compared to in a woman even though it's the same thing because a man is different from a woman the way i've heard it explained is that each sex inflects the same virtues differently 
And because what defines a man is the potential for fatherhood and what defines a woman is the potential for motherhood, fundamentally, the virtues are centered around those two roles. So with the man, for example, prudence is largely to do with leadership of a family. Yes. Yeah. I don't think that's covered much in schools, though. Well, gosh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in maybe certain pockets, maybe, I was going to say maybe at like an Eden or something like that or West Point, but uh, probably even not anymore. So I don't, I don't know where you would find the vestiges of, of those those concepts, certainly in just in bits and pockets, but not not the mainstream at all. Yeah, well, I know for a fact that there was at least one lesson where Eton boys got taught that a man can get pregnant. So that's uh, certainly not the case there. But many of these institutions are uncomfortable with the idea that the essence of a man is the potential for fatherhood and the essence of a woman is potential for motherhood. That's something that really upsets people. It, 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 uh, it does. I don't know why, though. I mean, I, I don't know what could be more obvious, uh, but maybe, maybe yes, yeah, stating obvious truths or obvious or calling out o obvious falsehoods is really what education is about. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the fact of the matter, isn't it? You don't get to choose what makes a man or a woman. This is just something mm -hmm. that is a given. And people don't like those kind of boundary conditions because it's a, it's a constraint on autonomy and being able to write your own story. I was going to say, mind you also, these are the very same people that will help them help themselves to moral relativism or moral nihilism or uh, some type of uh, biological determinism in, in the very next breath. So they're moral relativists one moment, then they're they're morally outraged at uh, essentializing uh, men and women. Why? But by what moral <laughs> standard? Who, who, who cares? Right. I mean, by their own account, who cares? So we're essentializing. So what? Yeah, that game of gotcha never gets old. You're really good at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, next point then we need to look at is that after the cardinal virtues, we then have three more that are added on top of them. And these are not acquired. These are infused. So there's a difference. The cardinal virtues are able to be acquired naturally, with God's help still, but naturally. Whereas the infused ones, they take us, as it were, uh, beyond human nature. So this is more like uh, God raising us up as we cling to him. So just to clarify, in case anybody isn't sure exactly yet what we're talking about with the cardinal virtues it's called cardinal from the latin cardo for hinge and then prudence is the habitual right thinking about things that have to be done in the moral order justice is the virtue which perfects the will so that we can order our acts rightly in relation to our fellow men temperance is the virtue that strengthens and orders the feelings of pain and pleasure, for example, and in fortitude helps us to do the right thing, even when we are, for example, afraid of death. So we do stuff for the right reason, consciously, which is prudence. We order it rightly with regard to society, that's justice. And we also have to persist in the face of obstacles, that's fortitude. And our choices have to be moderated, which is temperance. But then we add these on top. Faith, hope, and charity. The three theological virtues. Now, I really like the definition that Brian Davies gives in the thought of Thomas Aquinas of faith. It's what you have when it seems good to you to embrace what is taught by the content of Christian teaching. Faith is often talked about as if it's this weird, mysterious thing. Or if it's just blind faith. Have you heard that before? 
Yeah, we talked about that, I think, a bit in uh, Phaser, talking about the, uh, the heresy of fideism and, uh, yeah, this idea of just, I don't know, just shutting one's eyes and f- forcing oneself to accept whatever, whatever belief they're trying to will into existence or something. Yeah, so you don't reach a point where you just shut your eyes and take a leap of faith blindly. Instead, it's all built on rational assent. So you can reason your way to the existence of God, and then you can reason your way to acceptance of the resurrection. And then you can also reason your way to trusting in God's revelation for the aspects of revelation that you can't fully grasp rationally, like the Trinity, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm. So at no point is faith contrary to reason. So that's why I think this explanation of what Aquinas means by it is so good, because you're at the point where you think, right, I see what has been taught by the tradition of the church, and I understand the reasons for this, and I'm going to accept them. And then hope builds on this, because now that you believe these things, that you have faith in them, based on those rational grounds, then basically cheer up. Like, it's a big deal that this is true. Mm -hmm. Start acting like Mm -hmm. it matters, and that good things are going to come to pass eventually. I think that's exceptionally crucial in the present cultural and political moment where there's there, I mean, there's so many, it's easy, it's easy for people to fall into despair and to, to really wallow in it and to encourage others to, to despair. And so I think that this point about a habit of hope is, uh, it's really, really important, especially right now. Yeah. I mean, what would it make, how, how would it make sense for somebody to, um, accept Christian revelation and yet be somehow blackpilled. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It wouldn't, would yeah, it? Yeah, it wouldn't, no. Uh, you can get to that point with the vision of human nature in the world that you get in the Greek tragedies, for example, which is no matter how good the first four acts of the play of your life are, in the fifth one, that's it. You're dead and the earth goes on top of your head and we end in ultimate chaos. It makes more sense to be ultimately pessimistic there. But the point of Christianity is Dante titled his great poem, Divine Comedy. It's a comedy in the sense that it ends in order. It ends in happiness. That's Mm. what Shakespearean comedy is really about. It's about the marriage rather than the ending in death of tragedy. Comedies end in marriage and the great Christian comedy is about Christ and the bride of the church. It's that cosmic marriage. Hmm. Well said. So charity then, the ultimate goal of man is to enjoy God and to this charity directs him. So you've selected this quote from Tim's book about the hierarchical arrangement of the heavenly excellences. What is the hierarchy and why? So happily scripture furnishes us with a hierarchical arrangement of these heavenly excellences, fides, space, caritas. Uh, I think that the you need some type of ordering, right? You know, you, you need some type of uh, lexical priority that is given to these so that we don't run into the same problem that Aquinas is trying to wrestle with is uh, what, which of these ought to, to govern our decision-making or which, which should take priority. So you need, you need some type of hierarchy. Yeah. Let's get to that page where Tim gives a, an explanation of why the hierarchy that obtains between them uh, is the one that it is. I remember reading through it and thinking it was important. Do you remember which page it is? It's around 188, 189.
Charity's Top. I remember Charity's Top, but it had a nice yep. paragraph explaining uh, the reason for it. Mm. Page 187, there's a good bit. A householder's participation in the highest office of Christ, King, represents the supernatural virtue, caritas, his love, charity. Righteous men leading their households must be kingly in their distillation and presentation of paternal love. As St. Augustine constantly reminds us, this is the highest and the greatest virtue for a man to attain. In the domain of manly leadership, Caritas entails the patriarchal care exercised over disciples and subordinates that unfailingly serves their best interests. Kingly love is not for the faint of heart. The concept of kingly service should not be perverted into a subordinate, effeminate capacity. Unlike the corresponding Marian office pointed at by devoted womanly caritas, the office of king equals the ultimate position of earthly leadership. Often, caritas should feel like affection. Other times, it will feel tough. This is because Caritas is the perfected supernatural exercise of two natural virtues, justice and merciful prudence, at once. So, good explanation of how this is basically the Father being like Christ to the family. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's very well, well put. So on that note, then, we had this important point that the cultivation of male leadership begins with the chaste courtship. So we just heard about the importance of the father leading the family. This is pretty countercultural because people get told now that the best way to court somebody is to actually like try before you buy. You have to sleep with them before you marry them. And in fact, uh, a real man is going to try to make things sexual as soon as possible to show how alpha he is. So right, right. why does Tim say that the courtship should be chased in order to cultivate male leadership? Well, because the, the male is show, showing virtuous restraint and he's going to need that later on as a husband and as a, 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 as a father leader and you know, priest, prophet, king of the of the home. Uh, so that's a glimpse at his his future capacity to be a to be a leader, to be a male patriarch with all of his virtues in in proper check or pro proper order. Yeah. So what Tim's saying here is ultimately that chastity doesn't change when you get married. It's the same thing. So the guy who's not practicing it before marriage is going to fail at it while married as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what you see in the stats when premarital promiscuity doubles the risk of divorce. Right, right. This is what vice is. It's about being a vicious habit. Could you say a bit more about that? So what's it like when you just basically... Uh, dull your discernment about what constitutes good action to the extent that some of these guys end up at the point where they can't even recognize temptation for temptation anymore. Yeah, the uh, I think this connects up. Well, first of all, let's back up a second, talk about vice as being a excess or a deficiency of, of what the, the proper moderate virtue is. So in a lot of these instances, at least in the um, sexual case, it's, a, it's an excess of uh, the sexual appetite. And I think this connects up very much to the, the hedonic treadmill that, uh, that idea that we've talked about before in other book lessons where you have a constant re recentering of 
one's base or, or one's pleasure or satisfaction for particular things. And, and it, it's like a, like a drug addict that keeps getting, uh, needs more and more hot, stronger, stronger dose to get the same high. So you can imagine that applied to the sexual act and then writ large across an entire society. So then what looks moderate or what is moderate looks, looks like Spartan to, to that baseline, uh, because every, everything has been pulled to, to such, uh, an excessive space to such an excessive, um, amount. Let's relate that to the idea of the archery metaphor for sin. So what happens to the aim of this guy who has basically just thrown off all inhibition? What happens to his ability to see the target clearly and to hold the, the gun steady, as it were, and to fire at the right time? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this goes back very much to Phaser's quoting of Aristotle that, that one small error in one moment lead, leads to a uh, larger error down the line. So any type of marksmanship, uh, uh, you know, a, a simple uh, excessive amount or very small amount of just, just pulling slightly a bit with your, your trigger finger just a little bit off is going to result in a, a increasingly uh, erroneous shot uh, every time you fire. So these these errors tend to com can can compound quite severely uh, the more time goes on. And uh, in a similar way to correct these things, I mean, the, the analogy that I've always heard with respect to Aristotelian virtue, it's if you have like a bent board, the way to straighten the board, you don't bring, you don't bend it back to center. You, you have to bend it past center to to get it back to 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 its correct um, its 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 correct straightness. So that's why I think in society in a society where individuals have become overly vicious and hedonistic that overcorrection, it's, it's going to, it's going to look severe, but it need it needs to be severe. It need, it can't just be bending back to center. It needs to be past center in order to, to recorrect the habit. And Christian tradition has always recommended these kinds of practices to men mm. because of that. So yep. this is the point of mortification and, and fasting. It's yep. a bit like if you are training for, a fight, for example, you've done some MMA. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, you might make things harder for yourself in your training, like do something with a weighted vest on. Yep. So when you take yep. it off, things feel easier. And training the animal side of man, getting control of the passions, can be done really effectively with things like fasting, for example, because you're saying, mm -hmm. my willpower is really strong because I can cope with the extra challenges I'm imposing on myself. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that's really the, the, um, the value of these, those types of disciplines that we've all but forgotten. Well, people will talk about it in the gym, like, yeah, go, go heavy or go home, bro. Like you need to work really hard, no pain, no gain. But suddenly when it comes to the moral life and, with things like, well, sex in particular, then the idea that indulging every impulse you feel suddenly becomes alpha. That's the thing they think is great. But what if you do that with food? You get fat fast. I was going to say, yeah, it, it, you become fat fast and it's a type of, um, he, over hedonic consumptive way of being in the world is something just occurred to me is how it is that you'll have folks that they'll within that space be very, very disciplined Spartan with respect to, to, 
um, nutrition and exercise for the sake of overindulging in sexual hedonic uh, appetites. So mm. it's, you know, like there's, there is a, a um, schizophrenia there, it seems like. Oh, yeah, sure. You get people who will weigh their salad to make sure all the macros are right. And then after they finish their salad, they'll go and masturbate. <laughs> yeah yeah it's the um yeah it's a it's a schizophrenia of appetites right that's a great way to put it i think that's the phrase for today schizophrenia of appetites pleasure when it comes to eating is something that we've all got to learn how to control or you won't get your ripped six-pack abs you won't get the image you want but mm -hmm. pleasure when it comes to sex is something that we somehow just indulge in because yep. there's a different rule for that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And often the, the first thing is used as a, as a means towards the, the second thing. Right. Yeah, wow. you're right. There's a good connection between the two. And crucially, wow. they're both forms of effeminacy, which is wow. being derailed by pleasure, the pleasure of touch wow. with sex or the pleasure of taste with eating and being overpowered by one and straying from the right course of action the um the i it, it also ends up being a the the gypsy's curse too i think a lot of times where these folks they they get exactly what what they've asked for uh are you familiar with the the guy dan bilzerian do you know this guy at all no, he's so, no, he's sort of a, that name. he was a proto andrew tate he was a big instagram guy that surrounded himself with all sorts of models and whatnot and uh had harems that he would broadcast on instagram but in one interview i saw from him he, he was saying i'm so numbed out i'm so numbed out man i i need i need my harems to to feel anything it's just like like wow that's um so he's not even enjoying this this tower of titillation that he's it's just he's, it's substantively no different than the the rat hitting the the cocaine pellet dispenser hmm. except it's worse it's worse because he's, he's like ruining souls and people in the process that actually i take that back the cocaine dispenser is actually far far more humane um but yeah he, he even admits in the interview he's like i can't really feel anything anymore unless it's whatever uh is uh you know titillation like circus yeah that, that's why it's so terrifying that in dante's inferno the the deepest level of hell where satan is it's ice that's one of my favorite bits in that poem is ice not fire because mm. the real conclusion of nihilism is just indifference yeah yeah just just supreme just numbness uh, with respect to everything yeah yeah it's, it's, it's so profound if you haven't looked at that poem i'd really recommend it the way in mm. which the punishments correspond to the sins and then all the way down in the middle you've got just the icy core of hell mm. all right we went on the tangent there but i think it's really important because i think this is probably the most countercultural message in, in tim's book about what it really means to be a man and mm. it begins with chastity and temperance is uh, one of the cardinal virtues and what we're talking about here is having the strength to have self-control so indulgence emasculates but temperance strengthens and this is mm -hmm. something you see even in secular psychologists like william james yeah yep good all right let's move on to the next concept for other things to be ignorant of themselves is natural. For man, it is a defect. So what does this mean? We are rational animals, and that means we can understand what is good for us in a way, say, that a cat or an mm. elephant can't. Have I understood that rightly? Yeah, I think that sounds right. Tiger goes out and does tiger things, kills a zebra. He, he might not be aware of whatever moral impact that, that might be having to to his prey that he just just killed but that's what tigers do tigers don't have a rational will and an intellect so he's just doing tiger things but humans we do have a rational will and an intellect and uh that 
that create certain capacities and that cert- that generates certain responsibilities too. Yeah, I like that. The with the capacity comes responsibility. So strictly speaking, because tigers don't have a rational appetite because they lack an intellect, morality doesn't even apply to them. There's no moral evil in what the tiger is doing because he's not a moral agent. He's just mm-hmm. acting on instinct. So yep. that's why the idea that nature is so evil doesn't really make much sense because the root of all moral evil is free will, but animals don't mm-hmm. have it. Yeah. Yeah. There's no agency there to, to choose evil or good. So we've got this line from Boethius that Tim's quoted. I'll read the full thing to give a bit more context. Man towers above the rest of creation as long as he realizes his own nature. And when he forgets it, he sinks lower than the beasts. For other things to be ignorant of themselves is natural. For man, it is a defect. So you can end up lower than an animal. Mm -hmm. This is a really interesting point that Pascal makes as well. So Mm -hmm. we personify tigers and talk about them as being cruel, for example. And I've got three cats and they like to catch birds and mice. And... Mm -hmm. They will just play with it until it's dead, as cats do, and they won't even eat it. And it looks like the cat's being so cruel, but really it's just, you know, testing out its dexterity and its various skills for catching stuff. Even when it's not hungry, it likes to just be good at being a predator. Mm -hmm. But when a human, for example, tortures somebody, maybe it's committing war crimes or whatever, there's a real creativity there and a use of the intellect because you have Mm -hmm. to understand what it might be that inflicts maximum pain on the other rational animal. Mm. It becomes an art form. Yeah. Yeah. You've mentioned this both within the space of sex and violence. Humans have a unique capacity to be more depraved than, than just animals in, in both those, those domains. That's right. Yeah. Which comes back to the point that for me anyway, is one of the the most profound concepts I've got from Christianity that I have never heard articulated anywhere else is that the devil starts off as the brightest angel. And precisely mm-hmm. because of that, he has the potential yeah. to end up as Satan. So Lucifer, light bringer, when perverted, ends up as Satan. That's why the medieval theologians said the corruption of the best becomes the worst. The higher yeah. you are, the further you can fall. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the man's greatness also like logically entails his greater potential wretchedness. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. So how come then um, being promiscuous, for example, means that man can fall lower than an animal? I mean, baboons have harems. Why is it wrong for a human to? Well, baboons, uh, yeah, baboons don't have as much at stake, I would say, right, riding on their behavior as humans do. I mean, we just have so, so much more entailed with respect to that management of that behavior. I mean, we can collapse, we can build or collapse civilizations based upon this act, whereas baboons are, they're, they're just going to be doing baboon and bonobo things in little groups and that's 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 all they'll, they'll ever rise to or, or all they'll, they'll ever fall to and it will look generally the same whereas yeah we as you mentioned onion onwin before with mm. just a couple of generations of that that behavior being normalized can can ruin absolutely absolutely everything yeah exactly right and tim makes that point He says that for a man to impregnate many women proves utterly inconsistent with human nature. For a bull to impregnate many cows turns out to be perfectly consistent with animal nature. The proof is in the pudding. Animal unrestraint in regard to human sex has proven the key feature in the ruin of mankind. So monogamy fits human nature. Promiscuity doesn't because we're a different kind of thing than baboons are. Because you're a different kind of thing, fun and fundamentally different in kind, and this is why our enemies are so rushing to try to blur that distinction in as many ways as possible. 
Right. And as, as you forcefully argued on Twitter, no, you're not just an animal. That's it. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not monkeys. We're just yeah, not. Yeah. You, you, you are an animal, but you're a special kind of one. You're not less mm -hmm. than one, but you are more than one. Yeah. Yeah. Hence the word just. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's right. And the importance of marriage in this regard is articulated really well by St. Paul. And Tim quotes this. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. And St. Paul's argument is basically that this is because sexual immorality is occurring. So for fear of fornication, basically, uh, get married. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Celibacy is hard. It's only ever for a tiny minority of people um, aided by God. And if we don't get married, then the devil is going to have far more opportunities to tempt us. So people don't talk about this much nowadays, but mm -hmm. one of the reasons to get married, not the it's not the primary aim of it. That is the generation and education of children. But one of the reasons is so that you don't fornicate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's um, also consistent with Tim's point about the feminists. They, they made extra marital or non-marital behavior sexy and tried to make the marriage union look as sexless and boring and uh, uh, as possible. So that's another, another narrative that uh, was weaponized against, against the Christian ones. Right. No, no religion or philosophy has uh, talked up marriage as much as Christianity has. C.S. Lewis makes this point. Christianity isn't uh, anti-sex whatsoever. It's pro-sex. It says it's a great thing. And it acknowledges that human beings are prone to all kinds of sexual disorder and that marriage is the remedy for this. It wants to harness it and direct it towards its proper end, which is children. Mm -hmm. Now, we get, on the one hand, Christianity saying uh, sex is good, the body is good, there's no kind of view that the, the body is to be shamed or that it's inherently evil. But we get in contemporary culture this idea that if you tell someone that you're out of shape and you need to honor your body, then you're being really judgmental. And Tim has this great line about body positivity being a form of relativism, which is opposed to the Christian view of things. Mm -hmm. What did you make of this moment in the book? It really stood out to me. Yeah, I thought I thought that was spot on. And it just it just reminded me of all the body positivity movement. It's not only relativistic, it's also incoherent because these folks, they can't figure out whether or not obesity is uh, healthy or whether or not there's no such thing as obesity. And it's just a social construct. So they can't, like this is actually like a big debate within the body positivity moment that uh, they can't they can't figure out which which um, position to to um defend because they can't defend both <laughs> so, it's, so it's either there's no such thing as obesity because it's a social construct or there is such a thing as obesity it's just healthy so they you know <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> stuck again in postmodern world yeah that, that's another good gotcha moment on the conceptual level this is what happens when you let an analytic philosopher loose on you could you can do this all day oh yeah yeah it's fun <laughs> So the, the point with the body then is essentially about um, prudence again. Like it, it's imprudent to be overweight in a fundamental sense. Like you're, you're not um, doing your, yourself justice or your family or wider society. So um, a healthy body is like a, a tool that you can use in various ways that benefit the common good like first within your family but then beyond that as well mm -hmm. but people yep. ask me sometimes like how does your attitude to the gym differ from what you get from some of the manosphere guys and my answer to that in a nutshell is that it's not about the idolatry of the body it's about honoring the good thing that god has given you which is your body you're an embodied being after all taking care of it and trying to bring it to its fulfillment. So train hard, see what you're capable of, fulfill your potential and 
this is going to be a benefit to your family and also other people you might need to help with it. Yeah, certainly. That's, uh, yeah, the, this whole point about capability and capacity, I think is, is so huge. Yeah, we, we have minimal capacities that we need to honor so that we're not a burden on other people. But very quickly, if you can really train those capacities up in many situations, you could be a, you could be a lifesaver. You could be helpful. You could be useful. You could be inspiring to other folks that are trying to, trying to get their capacities up to speed. So yeah, I think that thinking it more in terms of capacities rather than superficial idolatry is, is the way to think about it. That's it. And reining it in from the disorder of taking drugs that are going to damage your health, for example, like you can make yourself infertile from abusing some of the bodybuilding drugs. Mm. Well, that's bad yeah. for a man. Yeah. That's contrary to natural law. This isn't something anybody ought to be doing. You can kill yourself early with damage to your heart. Uh, this is where you have let your interest in the gym um, become imprudent. You've gone off the right course of action. You've missed the mark to come back to mm. our archery point. Um, I've done this before, not with drugs, but just with having the goal of trying to see what the most weight I could bench press was and getting up to mm -hmm. around 200 kilos and weighing a lot for my height. And it was interfering with like health generally when I was a lot younger. Um, one of the things that was interfering with is my wife didn't find me very attractive at that weight because I was, what, 245 pounds at 5'10". And she was mm -hmm. like, nah, I prefer you when you're like 210. Can't you just lose a bit mm -hmm. of weight? I, like, I just got to get this weight. Um, <laughs> now, now I'm older. Um, I don't care as much about that kind of stuff. And it's another, it's another form of disordered um, attachment to something. It's missing the mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the word attachment is a great, great word for for these types of things. Yeah. Right. Let's finish off. So I love Tim's conclusion about destroying femini feminism by eradicating fornication among singles to the greatest possible extent. And then also like uh, revitalizing romance among married couples. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. men will often complain about feminism without realizing that they are in fact feminists by furthering the sexual revolution by continuing fornication. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not alpha bro to collapse civilization on top of all of us. <laughs> yeah, it's not, exactly. it's not, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not alpha to like saw the, the pillars that uh, are holding up the entire ceiling. Precisely it. And it's also not alpha to be unable to control your impulses. It's not alpha to be lacking in temperance. It's effeminate for the desire for pleasure to stray you from the right course of action that prudence dictates. You're a weak man if you're unable to stay the course. And because of that weakness, the radicals who want to destroy you and your society and your heritage have literally got you by the balls. Hmm. Well said. Right. Here ended the lesson for today then. I think we've had a good chat some good questions too um someone says uh, the channel is growing any plans for the future we've got a lot more books to do on here haven't we so i think we'll just keep going doing what we're doing yeah definitely and uh we'll try to get tim on next week to see if he can uh answer some questions as, as we finish off this this book yeah awesome okay well great to talk to you i'm looking forward to chatting with you next week with tim on as well awesome same right, here take care bye nice guys Later.